Some of the weirdest games ever made came out at a time when the chance to be a game developer was arguably a little easier than it is today. In the early to mid 80s when the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64 were ruling the roost in the UK and the latter was doing very well in America thank you very much, there were plenty of bright eyed and bushy tailed kids and young'uns keen to cut their teeth in the gaming industry by making their own game. And they wouldn't even need to rock up at a game company with a portfolio and a cover letter and fill out a form on a website that literally just asks everything that was already answered in their uploaded CV. They just need to respond to a publishing company's call for new games by sending in their tapes. And with the then young gaming landscape being so varied from big name developers right down to some kid pissing about on his parents' computer, the world of early gaming included a lot of bizarre games, like Dancing Monster for the Commodore 64. With the basic knowledge of coding the home computers required, anyone could rustle up something great or awful. Or, as is the case of this game, both. The Commodore 64 was released in 1982 and would go on to be one of the best selling computers ever. At a relatively affordable price point and an eventual enormous library of games and software, this beige bad lad was the darling of affordable home computing throughout the 80s. Interestingly, the popularity of video games on the computer was so great that Commodore went ahead and made their own game system out of the computer. The unimaginatively named Commodore 64 Game System or the C64 GS. The name just rolls right off the tongue. I made a video about it ages ago. The console was released in 1990, trying to slip its way in between the game giants Sega and Nintendo, which is retrospectively adorable and very stupid. The main problem with the C64 GS was that it had been designed without the pretty key aspect of a Commodore 64, the keyboard. Games which were more than playable on the system couldn't even be started if they required the player to press any key to get the game booted. Unsurprisingly, it flopped. Wow, I really got sidetracked there. Where were we? In any case, the fact the company would eventually release a gaming system version of their successful product is proof of how popular gaming on the C64 would become. It's thus interesting to look back on the earlier titles in its game library, ones that make you surprised that gamers didn't just pack in gaming altogether and go off and get into comics or films or cultivating a crippling sense of ennui instead. Now this video is sponsored by Lost in Cult, which is great because I am a big fan of their work. These books are freaking amazing. And they've got a new one up for pre-order right now, The Console Chronicles. This is a premium video game book from the curators of A Handheld History and Lock On. You get a 400 page hardback book, beautifully designed, filled with original artwork and input from video game experts, influencers and writers in the field. The focus here is the video game console and its history, spanning 50 years from Atari to Sega, Nintendo, Sony, come on you know all the brands, I don't need to tell you any of this. Made in collaboration with Hookshot Media, the people behind Nintendo Life, Push Square and loads more, this is a book you must have for your collection. I certainly will be getting it. So click the link below, grab yourself a copy as soon as you possibly can. You won't regret it. Now, before I go into Dancing Monster for the Commodore 64, I should say that the entire game is shrouded in a cloud of mystery. Informational articles about the game are especially sparse online. The writer of this script really had to do some digging to get even the slightest sliver of info regarding where the bobbins of a game like this would come from. Dancing Monster was published by Commodore Business Machines Limited, hereafter referred to with the initialism CBM in 1983, very early on in the 1982 computer's life. Commodore published several games under this long-winded business title, both games developed internally and ones from third-party developers. Dancing Monster is sometimes credited as being developed by CBM, but the title screen credits only Peter Ducani and Dean's Barn, two people who apparently disappeared off the face of the earth after making this game. Were they bedroom coders? Were they hired outright by Commodore? Stick around till the end because I might have the answers. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's take a quick look at the cover art and read the blurb so we know what to expect. Now, doesn't that cover art look great? Classic design, interesting and foreboding and a bit creepy. Some poor lass has got herself caught by a lad in a cape who is now lecturing her. No wonder she looks so absolutely done. She's shackled to the wall, so it's not like she can move to another carriage like commuters on the Victoria line do when one of those public preachers decide that we need to hear about brimstone at quarter past eight in the morning. 
The only way this situation could be worse is if he's reading her his self-insert Thundercats fan fiction. Chaining people to the wall is the only way to get them to listen to that, in my experience. It's utter bullshit the publishers of my retro tech books weren't interested in my erotic He-Man crossover, honestly. As you might have guessed, this game features that persistent trope of a princess needing to be rescued. Yes, in fantasy fiction princesses are useless at not getting nicked. Nice of a guy to let her keep her crown on, it's good to have a political prisoner display the pointless excess of her entitled existence. But where's the monster? Well, what we are seeing on the cover art might be the scene just before the game all kicks off. According to the instructions, this weirdo is an evil wizard who is about to change the princess into a hideous monster. Oh no! Why is he doing that? No idea. For the lols, presumably. A main hobby for a super evil wizard is to evilly turn attractive people ugly like a totally evil bastard. Presumably immediately after evilly setting default browsers to Microsoft Edge and evilly asking the IT department to fix something without putting in a ticket first. What a terrible git this wizard is. So, so evil. He's also going to have her dance forever to his quote, evil music. This is so incredibly evil, even the sound waves are nefarious. I've never known of music being described as evil before. Well, maybe Chris Rear. We better go and help her out. What a lovely title screen. Unassuming, simple. Our two developers get name checked right away. They must be very proud of their work. I like how the title lettering looks like it was scribbled on the back of a textbook by a 13 year old girl. To start, I'm going to go with the slow setting. There's not a lot of difference between the settings, slow, medium, fast, and very fast, but I'll get to that in a moment. Let's help the princess. The monster the super evil wizard turned this poor girl into is indeed utterly horrifying. It's a Frankenstein's mishmash of monster parts. Two black horns, a big pink trunk, flicky green tail, and of course, a pair of Levi's. You know, Levi jeans, a common part of any monster anatomy. Now that the princess has been turned into this purple elephant monster, she's cursed to keep dancing to the evil music we were told about, and she really does move. The girl could utterly cut up the dance floor on a Friday night, her talents are being wasted here in this very brown place. Where is she? Is she dancing in the field of mud? Oi mate, you're gonna ruin your Levi's! The poor thing has messed up her lipstick too. To be fair to her, it must have been hard to put that on with the big trunk in the way, but it's nice even looking how she does that she's attempted to take some pride in her appearance. She's got a blue tongue too. That means she's either got cyanosis, which is an illness from lack of oxygen in the bloodstream, or she's just downed a bottle of WKD blue. Judging by how she's dancing, I think it's the latter. By the way, no one tell YouTube that this is a female character. She is topless and her nipples are showing and are, according to terms of service, offensive and need blurring. Yes, even pixel nipples have a double standard. Ridiculous, isn't it? Where did those jeans come from? She's not wearing them on the cover art. Did the evil wizard magic them onto her because they are a terrible fit? Just to add insult to injury? They look like the kind of jeans you'd see on a white middle-aged dad. I think I've got a pair to be honest. She ought to have bright white trainers, reflective sunglasses, and a rolled up leaflet in her hand to complete the 50 year old dad at Disneyland look. So how are we going to help her? Well, we're going to shoot her. Yes, taking a leaf right out of certain law enforcement's books, we're going to defuse the situation by offloading bullets into it. On the Commodore 64, you wouldn't be able to play this without a joystick. You move the cursor around and try and shoot particular parts of the princess's body, which is harder than it looks because she's clearly three WKD blues deep and Grease Megamix has just come on in the club. I've got chills, you're terrifying. On the top is an indicator which goes down the longer you leave it between shots. Stop shooting and you lose the game, but keep constantly shooting and parts of her body that you shoot off will grow back. This means you must be accurate. No frantic button mashing here. You need to be shooting the parts of the body indicated up here. So now I need to shoot the horns. Now the trunk, now the ears. This is utter nonsense. What the 
flip. The body parts always need to be shot off in an order, unless one of them grows back seemingly at random. If you're quick enough and none of the parts go back, the order is horns, ears, trunk, tongue, arms, tail, then legs. If she wasn't horrifying enough, the nightmare fuel that presents itself once you get that trunk off is truly something to behold. And yes, this game was intended for children. What child would look at this Joker-esque mouth and buggy eyes and be able to sleep again? I'm in my 40s and I'm deeply uncomfortable seeing this thing. The little scream she does when a part of her gets shot off is not nice to hear. Thankfully, it's drowned out by the evil music. Namely, a modified version of Edward Grieg's In the Hall of the Mountain King. It's nice to hear the first time around and is certainly fitting with the overall experience, I guess, but it does get annoying after the millionth loop. Look at this. I'm playing a kid's game in which I'm watching a terrified armless torso of a girl wobble and gyrate back and forth in jeans. This is straight out of a best score video. Look at this and tell me there's a god. Go on, do it. Oh, oops, no, stop that. No, thank you, no. At this rate, I'm going to have to down some WKD blue myself. Here's what happens if you don't manage to shoot the princess to bits in time. Still in her monster form, she trudges dejectedly off the screen. Where is she going? To attack the nearest village? To be chased by angry peasants wielding pitchforks? Or maybe to lob herself into oncoming traffic? Who knows? Ah, what in the absolute sh The difference between slow mode and very fast mode isn't that great. The latter is certainly harder, but only because she moves around a lot more rather than a huge amount quicker. That being said, it's still winnable in a couple of minutes. It's not an especially difficult game. Once you know the order and her dance moves, you're good to go. While the dancing itself is randomized and you can't necessarily tell what moves she's going to throw out next, some moves she does tend to repeat for a few bars. For example, when she wiggles her tail at you like this, the moves are short, but more than long enough for you to position your cursor and shoot at the right moment. And once you've shot off all the pieces, here you go, the windscreen. Our monster is engulfed in magic and her true form is revealed, a purple woman who is not wearing jeans. She doesn't look hugely pleased at being saved, but she's probably very hungover. And that's it. No little message of congratulation, no update on what the evil wizard is up to now, just one purple princess staring at you from a blue screen. Fantastic. Is it a bad game? Yes. Is it an awful game? No, it's functional, it does what it sets out to do. It's playable in every sense of the word, and the fact it's so delightfully weird makes it go right back around again to being kind of awesome in a terrible, confounding way. But despite it being so bizarre and remembered by many traumatized then children, getting information on it is not easy. It won't ever go, you can't stop it. It just comes back every time you press stop. The game won't let you exit. We're stuck here forever. Who were Peter DeCarney and Dean's Barn? Did they work at Commodore? Did they make the game and send it in to be published by the computer company? Were they even of this world at all? Did they both slip in through a dimensional rift, give us the game, and then fold back into their own time? Well, thanks to getting someone else to spend precious days of their life to research and write this script for me, I may have the answer. In the May 1984 Commodore Horizons magazine, there's an interview with one Andromeda Software's David Bishop. He talks about the benefits of recruiting developers from countries not entirely customized with arcade games, namely how specifically Hungarian developers come up with original game content due to not having been widely exposed to games such as Pac-Man and Space Invaders. Those names on the title screen for Dancing Monster make more sense now. They must be Hungarian. According to Bishop, in 1982 Andromeda Software put out feelers for developers in Hungary by putting on competitions, inviting bedroom coders, storytellers and computer wizards alike to submit their games or even just their game ideas. We had about 1500 ideas submitted to us, in all kinds of formats. Some came in as sketches, some as complete storyboards. It's a little unclear whether Bishop took on developers from this competition, or they were on his books already from Hungarian Connections, made thanks to Andromeda's parent company and connections from CBM itself. 
In any case, the plan was to develop software which would then be licensed to external software houses. Andromeda would act as a sort of intermediary, if you will. Parent company Vulcan Media's managing director, Robert Stein, a Hungarian himself, notes that some of the games Andromeda were working on had aspects of Hungarian character in the concepts and characters. This is when he mentions Dancing Monster specifically, saying, In Commodore's Dancing Monster, we have the ridiculous dancing creature with the elephant's trunk. This is supposedly typical of Hungarian sense of humour. I did try to find out if the terrifying elephant-nosed creatures have some sort of satirical meaning in Hungary, but was unsuccessful. Or maybe the wearing of the jeans is a joke. According to some articles, which I'll link in the description, blue jeans first rocked up in Hungary in the 1960s and were super hard to get hold of because of the lack of cheap production methods and a bit of a crackdown on anything indicative of Western culture influences. By the time this game was released, however, jeans were so popular with the general public that local manufacturers made a point of getting hold of a license to make brand name products. So if you're Hungarian and can enlighten us on what in the utter bobbins the significance of jeans in Dancing Monster is, please do so in the comments. The story of a princess being cursed to dance while being a monster is certainly more reminiscent of a fairy tale. There is a fairy tale apparently popular in Hungary. Originally told in Denmark, the story The Princess in the Chest has various versions across Europe. It is retold in Hungary as a popular story for children about a princess who turns into a monster every night. A king and a queen were desperate to have a child. So desperate that the queen went to a witch for help. The witch told her that if she ate a bud from a special tree, she would bear a daughter. But if anyone but the little girl's nurse set eyes on her before her 14th birthday, the king would need to choose one of three things to bring her to life again. A pestilence, a devastating war, or putting the girl's dead body in a coffin, which must be watched over each day for a year. Just a day before her 14th birthday, the king could not take it any longer. He glimpsed his daughter, and now she was cursed, panicking. He chose to lay her now dead body into a wooden coffin. Setting a soldier to guard the crypt, he retired to mourn. Every morning, all that was left of the sentinel was a pile of bones. One day a stranger came to town looking for work. The soldiers got him drunk and convinced him to take the king's job of guarding the princess's coffin. He agreed, but tried to flee when he sobered up in the darkness, only to be stopped by a strange man. The man told him that he must hide in the pulpit and stay there until he heard the coffin lid slam. In the crypt, the stranger hid in the pulpit. He heard the coffin lid smash open. The princess, skeletal and pale, lurched in the darkness looking for the sentinel. But when midnight struck, she returned to her coffin. The next night, the man told the stranger to stay at the altar and hold a prayer book. Sure enough, the monstrous princess could not find the stranger and returned to her grave. On the third night, the man told the stranger to hide in the monster's coffin. So he did, slamming the lid closed after her corpse began stalking the stones. She screamed, begged, thumped on the coffin lid, but he did not open it. When dawn came, the stranger opened the coffin lid to see the princess, human and very much alive, sleeping on the sun-drenched stones. There you go, a popular fairy tale about a princess who turns into a monster. Another popular Hungarian folktale is a retelling of another European favourite fairy tale, The Twelve Dancing Princesses. There once was a king who had twelve daughters. All but one of the princesses wore out many pairs of shoes each night, and the king had no idea why. He promised the twelfth princess in marriage to the first man who could expose the secret. One day, a shepherd boy came to the court with secrets of his own, a pelt that could turn him invisible, and a bag that could never be filled. That night he donned the pelt and sneaked into the princess's room. That's when he saw a spirit fly in through the window and wake all but the twelfth princess. Excited, they started to get ready. The shepherd 
awoke the final, now confused princess. Her sisters were worried that she would tell the king their secret, so they invited her along for the night. They first came to a copper forest, then onto a silver forest, and finally a golden forest. At each one they drank from copper, silver, and finally gold cups. Unseen, the shepherd took a cup from each into his bottomless bag. They arrived at a great mountain. The spirit tapped the rocky face with a wand, and it split open to reveal a lavish ballroom full of magical creatures dancing. The princesses danced all night, wearing out many pairs of shoes. When the sun peeked through the clouds, the eleven princesses and the confused twelfth princess rushed back into their beds as if they had slept all night. The shepherd went to the king and told him what he had seen, showing the cups as proof. Satisfied, the king gave him his twelfth daughter in marriage. The eleven dancing princesses weren't so lucky. The king had them burned alive. That's the only bit of Hungarian folklore concerning a dancing princess the writer of this script could find. Cute, isn't it? Are those popular Hungarian fairy tales influences on Dancing Monster? Possibly. I'd like to think the creators of Dancing Monster were making their own slant on the whimsical tales they heard as children, with the express purpose of traumatizing a whole new generation with a trunk-faced Dancing Monster. Bishop says that the games Andromeda made all started off with a storyboarded game idea, then the appropriate developers were brought on and the details were ironed out. After that, Andromeda would set up a bidding war between software houses. That must mean that Commodore itself saw this utter horror and for some reason smashed their money down on the table. SOLD! Although Bishop says Andromeda wouldn't simply accept the biggest bid, they would always take into account the distribution network and publisher's commitment to the game itself, he notes specifically that Commodore, despite having secured Dancing Monster, didn't do very much promotion, you know, despite it being, quote, a very good game. Okay, mate, sure. At the article's publishing, a comparatively massive 180 people combined were working on games for Andromeda. Are two credited individuals for Dancing Monster among them? And that's where the trail ends. The writer of this script could not find out if either of them were the ones responsible for the idea or the extent to which either of them developed the game. In 1983, Commodore released Dancing Monster as part of a compilation edition of five fantasy-based games, just to really make sure as many children were traumatized as possible. And that's Dancing Monster, one of the weirder retro games you'll find yourself exposed to. Until next time, I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo. Thank <laughs> you.